intellectual property, trademarks. Trademarks are simple. They are signs that distinguish the goods or services of one enterprise from another. They are combinations of words, graphics, colors, etc. Historically, China has led the world in trademarks. Its arts, crafts, and manufacturing have been permeated with chops and brands for two and a half millennia. Establishing authenticity is an old Chinese profession. There are over 1,000 traditional Chinese brands with over a century of history that are still being sold in China today. Some of them go back more than 500 years. Today, China's most valuable brand is Guizhou Maotai. It's a relatively recent brand dating from the post-1949 collectivization of distilleries in Guizhou province into a single state owned enterprise that became the preferred supplier of spirits to Chinese Communist Party banquets. The market capitalization of the company, listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, is over renminbi 2 trillion. That's over US dollars 300 billion. That's mainly the capitalized value of the Mao Tai brand. Yet as old as trademarks are in China, Fake trademarks, called Maopai, are just as old. Bottles of Maopai Maotai probably outnumber bottles of real Maotai sold in China. Ever since China's WTO entry, China's trademark IP laws have tracked WTO TRIPS guidelines. SNPA is responsible for trademarks, as it is for copyright and patents. Trademarks can be registered with SNPA for terms of 10 years and can be renewed indefinitely thereafter. Trademarks are protected in law if they are registered. Today, trademark piracy, including piracy of foreign trademarks in China, is rampant. Why? Several reasons. One of the early innovations in China's reform and opening up were the special economic zones. These were started as export processing zones. They linked to global supply chains. Local entrepreneurs focused on meticulously following the specifications of original equipment manufacturers. And these OEMs gladly outsourced production of their products to low labor cost locations, including China. Local entrepreneurs also focused on reducing their costs to compete against other local entrepreneurs and against foreign entrepreneurs for the OEM business, even as their costs of labor, land, and raw materials increased. The factories were manned largely by workers from the countryside. At the start, education was elementary. Wages were low, living conditions were poor, processes were very labor-intensive. Peasants tend to be entrepreneurial. As they gained experience on shop floors, many took their hard-earned knowledge to start their own companies. This mushrooming of entrepreneurship dispersed knowledge into the new ventures. If processes could be subcontracted more cheaply than by keeping them in-house, the entrepreneurs subcontracted the processes. Often, former employees served as subcontractors to their former employers. The initial markets were exclusively the OEMs, yet inevitably the Chinese local suppliers turned their newly acquired skills to sell their product in alternative foreign and domestic markets. The trade-off was simple. If they could sell the product to alternative buyers without destroying more profitable relationships with the OEMs, they did so to utilize excess production capacity, to diversify market risk, to increase revenues, and ultimately to make more money. And in the process, the designs, labels, hang tags, packaging, the stuff of trademarks were just sets of specifications to be meticulously followed. It helped that some OEMs were lax in registering and or defending their IP in China and other locations outside their home countries. 
a copycat culture with a Robin Hood style ethos known as Shanjai or Mountain Village emerged especially in the most successful special economic zone, Shenzhen. Shanjai extols nimble design, sourcing, production, and distribution with little regard for IP. Copying involves speed, creativity, innovation, and pride. Rapid design and prototyping is facilitated by close cooperation between suppliers, designers, manufacturers, and distributors. To enforce against trademark infringement, one needs to catch manufacturers and distributors with the infringing product. But dispersed, flexible, vigilant, and informed infringers with good connections to local authorities makes apprehension difficult. Chinese production of counterfeit goods is an embarrassment, especially at the national level. The government has reacted with tightened trademark education, legislation, and enforcement. At the same time, the government encourages entrepreneurship, encouraging entrepreneurs to appropriately use IP responsibly. Setting trademark fees low and making registration of trademarks easy is part of encouraging entrepreneurs to use responsibly intellectual property. But new regulations often have unintended consequences. For example, in 2009, the Taiwan company ProView purchased from a British company the rights in China to a trademark that the British company had legally registered in China years before, iPad. That trademark became increasingly valuable after Apple rolled out its iPad worldwide in 2010. Apple sued ProView in Guangzhou. In mid-2012, Apple ended its suit against ProView, out of court, by paying ProView $60 million to purchase the Chinese rights to the trademark iPad. The news resounded like the starting gun of a gold rush. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese entrepreneurs staked their trademark claims. By 2019, China was registering more than 8 million new trademarks per year, more than four times the number of new trademarks per year registered in the United States. The trademark law of 2019 gives SNPO sweeping powers to reject bad faith trademark applications and to punish pirates. But the last rules of the trademark game in China, and indeed in the world, have yet to be written.